Okay, guys, uh, it's a Twisted History podcast. We're going to go back to some history today. Uh, makes sense. We're going to do the Twisted History of Double Jeopardy. Twisted History of Double Jeopardy is uh, something that fascinates me. We've seen a bunch of movies on it that I love. But before we get into that, we're going to do a couple of DMs. One was from this guy named Dan E. Who He wants a Twisted History of Large. What do you think? Like, I could do it standing on Twisted head. History <laughs> of the Twisted History of Stu Finer. I'm, I'm saying maybe not, because I think the Twisted History of Stu Finer is kind of a one-off. If we right? do the Twisted yeah, History of Large, I want to host it. Oh, yeah. I, would I even be in the room? I mean, I would think that I probably I probably should. I know more about me than and anyone. But I, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. Maybe collect the Twisted History of the Twisted History crew or something like that. And that's not to discount myself. I've had an incredibly uh, blessed and interesting life leading right up to a happy 25-year marriage pretty soon and three wonderful kids. But... Um, you know, from the mean streets of Brooklyn to the mean streets of South Bend, Indiana, to the mean streets of Ridgewood, New Jersey is fucking fascinating. But I don't know if it's going to go. This is one of the reasons why I use Dan's um, DM, because he also says, uh, my girlfriend, Julie, absolutely hates the podcast, but she suffers through it on every road trip and every carpool to work. So right away, I was incensed. And I said, ooh, Julie spells her name J-U-L-E-I-G-H. What a stupid way to say it. Julie is stupid. But if she's sitting through this stuff, like particularly if she doesn't like history, if she doesn't like my voice, your voice, your voice, your voice, woman's a fucking saint. She's up there with St. Anne. So shout out to Julie. I changed my mind on her, even though her name is spelt incorrectly. Um, the second letter we got was uh, from Josh Helgerman. Large, you were talking about the, in the history of ma the mailbag thing, uh, dying years after the incident. I thought this was pretty interesting. Josh Helgerman said, my great-grandfather died 68 years after being mustard gassed in World War I. He says, from the gas, 68 years after. That's the whole DM. So I don't know specifically what his grandfather died of, but... Mustard gas, chemical use, uh, exposure to mustard gas agents have caused skin cancers, respiratory and skin conditions, leukemia, several eye conditions. You see a lot of people went blind on the battlefields in World War I. Bone marrow depression, immunosuppression, psychological disorders, and sexual dysfunction. And by the way, Josh Helgerman's great-grandfather had no sexual dysfunction. That guy was fucking shooting ropes until the day he died. That's what I'm saying because the guy's a fucking hero. Chemical use in the productions of chemical weapons left residues in the soil where the weapons were used. And those chemicals have been, uh, the, those chemicals that have been detected can cause cancer and affect the brain, blood, liver, kidneys, and skin. The development and production of chemical weapons threatened public health. So not only did war gases like mustard and chlorine endanger the lives of soldiers, but also threaten the safety of workers who manufactured them. The reason I gave you that little diatribe was to tell you. There are a lot of ways that downstream mustard and chlorine gas can fuck you up. So I'm assuming that this gentleman's great-grandfather perhaps died of some sort of immunosuppression or some sort of leukemia related to the mustard gas. So my question is to you guys, 68 years after this happened, does this count as a World War I death? Before you answer, the reason he brought that up when he said we talked about you know, dying years after the incident. I'm going to recap for people who don't listen to every one of these podcasts. Hillsboro, right? 1989, 94 people died on that day. 10-year-old all the way up to 67 years old. Another person died in the hospital a couple of days later, bringing it up to 95. That person, di that person counts. Another victim died in 1993, four years later. And then in July of 2021, a coroner ruled that Andrew Devine, who died 32 years after suffering severe and irreversible brain damage on the day, was the 97th victim. And I think we all said, oh, shit, he was in a coma from that? Oh, yeah, he's definitely a fucking victim. Mm -hmm. And everyone counts him as a victim because some guy named Brandon Jackson and a couple of others mentioned Patty the Batty, who works for us, or we kind of own the rights, or yeah. so, whatever the fuck it is. I've never met Patty the Batty. He's a uh, MMA guy from Liverpool. So he's got a horse in that race. He's got a horse in the race of, you know, Liverpool uh, soccer and all that kind of stuff. So he's invested, as like people from New York are invested in 9-11. And he sings Justice for the 97 every now and again because he's what they call a scouser. A scouser is somebody from Liverpool. They got those disgusting accents and whatnot. So apparently that guy who had died 
so many years later does count because Justice for the 97 includes the dude who died of irreversible brain damage 32 years later. Then the twisted history of the Eagles of Death Metal tragedy, right? We said there were coordinated bombings in Paris in 2015. We brought the number of victims up to 131 to include a man who survived the bombings but then killed himself two years later after the attacks due to PTSD. And we said, okay, he counts too. Like he goes to the death toll. Does this guy's great grandfather count the death pool, uh, the death toll of World War One? It doesn't matter. And if this guy wants his grandfather to count, then his grandfather counts. That's a simple answer. I'm just saying, does he? Is that a World War Two victim? As long as he didn't get hit by a city bus and that's his cause of death, then <laughs> exactly. yeah. As long as it was like complications of the lungs. But here's a question: <laughs> stuff like Agent Orange. Right. There were like birth defects and stuff that happened to the, yes. the kids. Are the kids victims of the Vietnam War and a casualty of war? So people who weren't alive when the conflict... That's a fucking great question. Yeah. So people weren't even alive when the conflict began. But like I had said, grew up on the soils near where, you know, the tre- in, in a pre where the trenches were. And so they, you know, had the the downstream effects of it mm-hmm. or were born the lobster babies who were born after Agent Orange or something. Do they count? I'm saying no. If you weren't born around the tragedy, no, I'm not saying no because it's a direct result yeah. Yeah. of World War One or Agent Orange or, you know, um, I don't know, uh, Three Mile Island. Well, what about the babies from Sweden? Remember when the girls were prostitutes and then they got shipped back and yeah. then they had all these babies that nobody wanted? Yeah. What about 9-11? Do you suffer from mesothelioma? Like, you see those things. Did you drink water at Camp Lejeune? Did you drink water at Camp Lejeune? Yeah. Yeah, Like, you know, even though Camp Lejeune isn't like a one event. Mm -hmm. Like, are people who are dying from lung cancer victims of 9-11? I know they're not getting added to the wall. Well, it's like, do they, were they also smokers? Because, like, that also factors in, too. Because then it's like, it's not a direct cause. It may be aided to it. So... If Grandpappy yeah. was just ripping Sorry. darts all day. <laughs> well, Josh, did, yeah, Josh Helgerman didn't give me, so he gave me his name. He didn't give me his grandfather's name. It's fucking disrespectful, Josh, yeah. right? <laughs> like, I don't know if Josh Hel- Helgerman is shooting child porn in his basement, but I do know his grandfather fought in World War One. That's that's the dude. I'm going to give another example a little later on. So, yeah, I don't know what his lifestyle was. Like, let's say the guy was a triathlete vegan, and he died simply from a... Broken gas nodule that a broken glass nodule that developed in his lung as a result of mustard gas. Like you know, maybe that counts. I don't know. That 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 intrigued me for a second. Mm-hmm. It's right? interesting. I guess that's why with all the statistics and numbers, they always approximate it. And I mean, you got to remember that it gets blurry. Yeah, it's never going to be an exact figure. I heard a delayed death actually recently. I was working on a blog of sorts that might come out, um, but a Disney World Disneyland death. Um, it was the Roger Rabbit cartoon road ride or whatever, a right. spinning car ride, and a four-year-old kid fell out of the cart, got dragged by the coaster onto the tracks, and nine years later died from injuries that he never recovered from. Damn. Insane. I would say that qualifies. That's the same thing as the guy That's who died saying, yeah. after yeah. the Hillsborough. I think they maybe even right? won uh, a lawsuit there as well. That's against I will tell you who, who disagrees vehemently that it counts, and that's Disney. Yeah. Disney yeah. is the type of place where if you have a heart attack, they rush in, put you on a stretcher, and make sure that you die in the parking lot and not in the park. So right. actually, you that know? was something that I also heard about was there was a stabbing in the 80s, uh, 1983 in Tomorrowland. Apparently, some guy went up, pinched a random guy's girlfriend. He was an 18-year-old. This is a 28-year-old. The 28-year-old proceeded to stab him, and Disney rewarded 60000 for failure to get uh, medical services there faster. And ever since, they've changed the way that they manage uh, health situations. Instead of going directly to, like, the park um, health assistance or whatever, they bring in, like, the official ambulance right. and everything. Right, okay. So. Yeah. Wow. I yeah, and I, even the, when the kid got eaten by the crocodile. You, yep. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like Jeff D. Lowe's ears perked up somewhere when we <laughs> oh, mentioned yeah. Disney. Yeah. I feel like he knows oh, all shit. the secrets yeah. and hidden oh, things. I about got him beat. I got him beat. You do? Yeah. The alligator oh, yeah. digested oh, you outside know who's of got Disneyland. You beat? Jake Marsh. Yeah. With Universal Studios? Oh, no, no, no. Found oh, out, brother. No. Found out yesterday Jake Marsh's bar mitzvah was at Universal Studios. He became a man at I've, Universal I've Studios. Been, I've been like 30-something odd times. Okay. Actually, we'll at there? Head. Yes. That's a flex. It, it was... It was. I mean, it, Jeff doesn't get... So one of our niche categories 
is weird stuff for me. Like I, I've done a bunch of ones that I don't even want to do. Aren't you John Mayer? Isn't he that John yours? Mayer? But John, but John, Mayer. but John, John Mayer. John Vibbs also answers like when we do uh, <laughs> Richard Nixon. Vibbsy's right in there with that. Uh, you know, somebody might have an idea of a John Mayer song if if you know uh, maybe, but they don't. Vibbs is good with that. Uh, Marsh is, is Universal Studio Rides, Ooh. and when they do it, me and Vibs, we I don't even look at the question, nope. and the question doesn't get to the end before he goes. Come you on, know, Willy Wonka's wacky waka waka, and yeah. uh, you know, like really? he's he's on there. Yeah, well, that's if the, you need the, the, the a dozen. sub. That sounds uh, like a perfect it. situation. <laughs> <laughs> that's we'll phone a friend right, for yeah. the uh, for the niche guy. How many yeah. people did he have his bar mitzvah? At his bar mitzvah. Great question. One hundred and fifteen. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Maybe I mean, to it was take in, everybody to Universal is legit. By the way, is he single? There's jo- a lot. No, of, I believe. Is he yeah. married? Did Why, he get you're married? Did he make a move? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. we could. You know, you always want to be one of the chosen. I'm just saying we could. You know, raffle off a date with. <laughs> oh, date night with Jake Marsh. Right. I mean, <laughs> people are going to be flocking to that. <laughs> Why well, lose you? I didn't think I was going to lose you to a guy who had a bar mitzvah at fucking <laughs> Universal. <laughs> or, or a guy who's 20 more. something. Yeah, aim oh, higher. Good. Yay, me. Uh, Look at and that. that's no dig on Jake. He's wonderful. Oh. All right, next uh, letter. Exactly. This that's is from uh, Logan. Just to piggyback off your ending of the most recent pod, I'm a big fan, but this is a tough and recent one. Patrick Kane of the Blackhawks at the time, after a rape allegation, so he was playing the Flyers, and the whole Philly crowd was saying, She said no. She said no. That's tough. That's rough. Yeah. Another one. This one I'm not going to tell the guy's name. Unlike Helgerman, because he's not the person. Like I should have known about Helgerman's grand grandfather. Heard you guys talking. I uh, heard you guys talk about the guy listening to every episode. I had to buy my mom AirPods specifically to listen to Twisted because she's convinced the speakers on her phone do not work. I don't know what platform it is, but some people tell me that Twisted's very low. I don't know. I, and we've gone to, you know, the people in charge about it. I don't know. I don't I don't um, I don't get that when I listen Large, to I'll, it. I'll go straight to their office again to, this morning. Right. Yeah, after, yeah, right. We'll after this podcast. Cool. I'll right go in. up there and I'll talk right. to them. Um, but anyway, she listens to it on AirPods. And this is the good thing. She's a breast cancer survivor. So maybe the history of cancer survivors would be sick. Most importantly, her name is Jen Bennett. So there is a breast cancer survivor who loves us so much that she listens on AirPods because the speakers on her phone do not work. I don't know what her son's name is. I don't care. Shout out Jen Bennett. I appreciate you listening. I wonder if she's just embarrassed of listening out loud. I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah. She's around the family. We're right. dropping massive and pendulous. Yeah, she exactly. wants the AirPods on. Yeah, board. I was going to use her listen. as an example. <laughs> that the only other thing I know about Jen Bennett, other than the fact that she's a cancer survivor, mm-hmm. gigantic cans on her beautiful i'm just joking jen now. i apologize yes absolutely beautiful, beautiful. Bre- yes cancer-free yeah. big cans Good on her, her. Which is i awesome. think she deserves a round uh, of applause. yeah what's up round of car yeah cancer-free big cans that's awesome um uh double jeopardy <laughs> <laughs> Oof, we're dancing um double jeopardy uh it's a procedural defense what does that mean what's a procedural defense i, I urge anyone who's a lawyer to uh, to kind of come at me. My kung fu is not strong on 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 legal jargon or anything like that. Maybe better than the average moron, but if you have something to add, I'm talking in broad strokes because um, we can't be sued or anything like that. I really don't give a shit. If anyone's going to sue us, it's Jen Bennett. Um, but so I'm going to be pretty vague on purpose because I don't know a lot about it, even though I almost went to law school. Uh, but it's a procedural defense. Um, and again, correct me. A regular defense would be, hey, I didn't do this. And here's why. OJ, gloves didn't fit. You must have quit, right? Procedural defense challenges the legitimacy of a legal proceeding, right? So it's more like a maybe I did it, maybe I didn't, right? But it doesn't matter because you have no right to try me for it. You know what I mean? I'm out of order. This whole court's out of order type oh, shit. Order. Hell yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, so you have no right to put me on trial for this as opposed to... Um, I didn't know she was, you know, married. Okay, I didn't know I didn't he had his. No. I didn't know he had his bar mitzvah at Universal. <laughs> All right. So that being said, double jeopardy is a procedural defense that prevents an accused person from being tried again on the same or similar charges following an acquittal or conviction. It originated in ancient Roman law, in the broader principle non bis in item, not twice against the same. Different countries have different interpretations, 
but the U.S. law against double jeopardy is maintained in its full rigor. USA, big double jeopardy place. And the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution provides for it. I'm about to read you the Fifth Amendment. It was proposed by Congress in 1789. Everyone should have heard this once before, but I doubt they have. I'm so down on people being educated now. I actually definitely have heard this. Yeah. I'm a poly sci major. You yeah. Got, you got to know your amendments when you're in like grade school. Or you got to talk about them. You've heard them somewhere along the line. Yeah. Like, yeah. And one of the gentlemen that we're going to speak about, which is the probably most famous double jeopardy case, I'm hoping I'm not introducing it to people for the first time. But then I kind of hoping that I am. Because if somebody's like, oh, I heard about that on Twisted History, that's good. Here's your Fifth Amendment. One, no pa- person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arrive- arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Two, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life and limb. So we're going to talk about today. Three, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Four, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. Five, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So those little things, I added the one, two, three, four, and five just to break it up. Those five little bullet points here are basic rights provided to us underneath the Fifth Amendment um, from 1789. And there's some big boys in there, which I'm not going to care about today. The only one I'm going to care about is, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. By the way, he risked life and limb. He, you know, don't risk life or limb. That's the first time it was ever used in popular saying. It was in the Fifth Amendment. Oh, he risked his life and limb. Um, So as I understand it, the idea behind double jeopardy is to provide finality with judicial decisions. Because we're in such a litigious culture, there are so many people who want to not accept what's handed down, so they're constantly trying to try again and again and again. So, you know, you can do that to a certain degree, but double jeopardy allows you protection from being tried for the same crime twice you just you just go to court a billion times and bleed all your money out and exactly or yeah or, or bleed the public's money out in the meantime or bleed your opponent's money out in mm-hmm. the meantime there has to be some degree of finality so i agree with it um and more know, judges now i noticed than ever yeah. are not allowing appeals have you noticed yeah, so that? the appeals process in the united states is ridiculous like no but they're they're you know i see it in nascar like, you know, NASCAR hands down a fine or in football or in any sport. And, and it goes to the appeals. Pro- and then that fine never holds up. I noticed it, it with the bullshit. Alex Murdoch trial because Jack and I were watching it religiously. Yeah. It was kind of mm-hmm. like a soap opera. We were like, mm-hmm. oh, what's going to happen? Oh, yeah. yeah. But he appealed and they told him no. So I was reading an article on how more judges today are saying no to appeals than, than ever before. Yeah. Right. Uh, not that it's as big a, a case, but I know Tom Brady – his like deflate gate thing. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. went through what two courts, and at first he was like innocent, and then all of a sudden he got tried again, and he was guilty. Yeah, yeah. and and listen, this this benefits the innocent, right? Like if I ever get accused of a crime, and I get found innocent of it, and I am innocent of it, I'd like to walk out of the court and know, okay, that's over, right? Like finality is a good thing, but obviously there's the other side of the coin where it's had just absolutely disastrous results. We're going to concentrate kind of on the disastrous today. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions. Exceptions Again, I don't have a law degree, so perhaps there are a ton more exceptions that I'm about to give you, but I'm going to give you the, um, the, the three biggies. Uh, one, if a defendant bribed a judge into acquitting him, then technically the defendant was not in jeopardy the first time, right, because it was fixed and can be retried. Thank God. Like, that's a good one, mm-hmm. right, if you find out. I wonder mm-hmm. if that came up at all with, like, mob trials or anything. Yeah, that's what know? it, it yeah. reeks of the untouchables yeah. with the matchbook and, and stuff like that. So, um, or the, the list of jurors and how much money they were paid. So, that, it's nice that that's in there because if you get, you know, 
If you get uh, convicted by a dirty judge, it should be able to be overturned or retried. Uh, two, a member of the armed forces can be retried by court-martial in a military court, even if he or she had previously been acquitted by a civilian court. So if you're in the military and you get away with something, not so fast. Um, you can be retried by a military court. Three, similarly, an individual can be prosecuted by both the United States and an Indian tribe for the same acts that constituted crimes in both jurisdictions. So the military and Indian tribes, it seems like they don't have double jeopardy, which is kind of cool, I guess. Uh, the reason I'm doing this episode is because a listener named Caleb turned me on to the story of Mel Ignatow. Um, Caleb wrote, I quote, I'm a Louisville kid. And prior to 2020, one of our most famous one of our most famous local stories was the double jeopardy case of Mel Ignatow. This case is nuts, and I believe you'd find this so interesting. Prior to 2020, one of our most famous local stories. I was, I'm reading this now out loud. What happened in Louisville after 2020 that uh, overtook this dude? I, uh, I want to say like Black Lives Matter. During that, there was a, a oh, girl that got shot in bed. Okay. I think that right. was the big... Okay. Maybe is I'm that, wrong. Is that the... Yeah, but I that's, thought that was Louisville. Is that the Shauna, Is my second name correct? Shauna Taylor? Is that what talking about? I think Perhaps. so. Perhaps. Yeah, okay. And uh, again, I just read that. Uh, Brianna Taylor. Brianna, Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor. Um, Thank you. Was that Louisville? Yeah. Louisville. Her Louisville home, Kentucky. Yeah. In 2020? Uh, yes. Yeah, March 13th, okay. 2020. Yeah. yeah. So that so, was... Wow. So Vince I guess is on today. Kelly. I think that was like the... Yeah. The, yeah. That was like... The, March 13th, 2020 was like the day COVID like... Happened. I remember the, yeah. the like the Big East tournament stopped at like whenever halftime. Tom Hanks got it, we all knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they got our dad. That, that was like yeah. a couple months after, yeah. I think. Or weeks. Same thing when he got it, uh, AIDS in Philadelphia. Yeah, true. I was like, oof, this shit's this shit's serious. It got the Hanks. <laughs> um, all right, so that's great. Fib, you finished this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. so twenty twenty shit hit the fan. Brianna Taylor and beyond. But this guy is saying, you know, before that, Louisville, uh, you know, their most despicable. Um, happening was the double jeopardy case of Mel Ignatow. He gave me a quick summary on it, like little bullet points, which I love. That's the only reason I looked into Mel Ignatow. I'd never fucking heard of the guy before. But I'm going to take the scenic route on this guy because he's known as the most hated man in Louisville. Uh, Melvin Henry Ignatow, which is a disgusting name. Gross. Melvin Henry Ignatow. That does not fall. I mean, that would look terrible. Sounds like a limerick. Name. Like a, uh, a limerick character. Yeah. <laughs> Melvin Henry Ignatow. Uh, yeah, went to a farm and fucked a cow. You know, came yeah. back sore, don't know how, Melvin Henry Ignatow. Yeah, Boom, right exactly. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fucking bars. Um, thanks. He was born in Pennsylvania, but he moved to Louisville. And he met a young lady who was, I think, much younger than them. Her name was Brenda Schaefer. She was a doctor's assistant. They went on a blind date in the fall of 1986. I'm just going to yell that out a couple of times. We're looking at 1986 when they began dating. Two years into the relationship, Schaefer began hinting to coworkers and family members that Ignatow was abusive. And in August of 1988, so two years later... Schaefer told her friends that she hated and was afraid of Ignatow and intended to break up with him. He saw the writing on the wall, too. Like, he kind of knew what was about to happen. Like, she's like, we got to talk. Mm. You know, that's what's going to happen. We got to talk. That's when I don't come home when you say that. Um, so he began plotting with his ex-girlfriend, uh, this gem called Marianne Shore. I mean, this also teaspoon of cum. Ooh. So they began plotting to kill his now girlfriend was about to break up with him, him do his we, ex-girlfriend. Do we know what's in it for Marianne Shore? Is she just in love with paid her, her ex? Yeah, I think he paid her a dick. Yeah, um, nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ignatow and Shore decided that the murder would happen at Shore's house. And the two spent weeks making plans, digging a grave, soundproofing the walls. It was like no, the toolbox killer. Yeah, it was no gray area. It was creepy. Shit like this, right? Yeah, it was no gray area here. And on September 24th, 1988, uh, Schaefer met up with Ignatow to return the jewelry he had given her, right? And he had forced her um, to go to Shore's home. And once there, he pulled out a gun and locked her in the house. He tied her to a glass coffee table, okay? Glass coffee table. Uh, he stripped her, he blindfolded her, and gagged her before raping and torturing her. Ignatow then killed his 36-year-old girlfriend using chloroform. Meanwhile, Shore stood by taking a shitload of photos of all the abuse. So she was like sexually into it and that's 100%. why that was her payment. Okay. Yep. Melvin She's a fucked Henry up person. Ignatow and Mary Shore were fucking evil freaks. Okay? The next day, Schaefer was reported missing. Her abandoned car was found 
near where she lived with her parents, and it wasn't long before Ignatow was singled out as the lead suspect. That makes sense. She's nowhere Duh. to be found, and she had an abusive boyfriend. It's, it's always the boyfriend, yeah. even if even when they're not well, abusive yeah. and have signs. Yeah. He, well, the boyfriend's always the first suspect. And, you but know what the, I mean? you got to go. But the one cop is like, I don't know. What's the boyfriend's name? Melvin Henry Ignatow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Get him in the lineup. <laughs> yeah. Right? Cuff him. <laughs> However, in following investigations, authorities couldn't find a witness or physical evidence that linked Mel Ignatow to Schaefer's disappearance, and he vehemently denied having anything to do with it. And Schaefer's body still hadn't been found. Again, they searched. They wouldn't go and be like, well, what's your ex-girlfriend's name? Let's go check her house. So he seemed like he was pretty much in the clear. Uh, in 1989, right? So we started in 86, killed in 88. 1989, police told Melvin Ignatow he could testify before a grand jury to clear his name. So it's a little bit of uh, something I want you to remember. He did testify here. It was during that hearing that Ignatow had mentioned Mary Shore for the first time. I don't know how. Maybe he used her as an alibi or something like that. So investigators then questioned Shore, and she broke right away. She readily admitted to assisting Ignatow in the murder and even led police to where the body was buried. So finally, 14 months after Schaefer had gone missing, her body was dug up, bearing signs of abuse that seemed to line up with Shore's claim. She dropped a dime on this dude. He just so the, absolutely dropped a dime on this dude, and they found the body. He just brought up his his yeah. accomplice out of nowhere. Yeah, he, well, where were you that night? Oh, I think maybe I was with Mary. Who's Mary? Mary Shore. Who's that? That's my ex-girlfriend. Let's check out Mary Shore. Hey, Mary, where were you that he night? He did it. I did it. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I, was, I, I feel like it's like when your friend is like dating someone new, and She's, they just like have to bring up the person in a conversation. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, Mary and I were yeah, yeah. out that yeah. night. Yeah. Like, Ooh, oh, who's Mary? Melvin Henry. Um, and despite a lack of DNA evidence that might help single out a suspect, Ignatow was finally charged with Brenda Schaefer's murder. The trial, however, went horribly wrong. As you could imagine, Mary was a freak. So Mary Shore was giggling on the witness stand. She left a terrible impression, and it hurted her credibility in the eyes of the jury, so much so that the defense even suggested that Mary Shore had killed Brenda Schaefer out of jealousy, like she implicated herself so much with her freakiness. Ultimately, the jury determined that there was not enough evidence to convict Ignatow. And on December 22nd, a couple days before Christmas, 1991, so I just took you on a five-year journey, Mel Ignatow was acquitted of the rape and murder of Brenda Schaefer. He got off. Ignatow got off 100%. Okay, so 1991, and Ignatow is found innocent. The judge on the case, embarrassed by the trial's outcome, actually wrote a personal apology to Schaefer's parents wow. for how the shit went down. That, That's something. I don't know. That's like when the NBA is like, well, I know the, the game is over and they won, but right. I'm really sorry. Like, they can't do anything after that. It's I felt that way too, Jeff. empty, yeah. Take this letter and shove it up your ass. Yeah. If, yeah. You, if you really my cared. Daughter's my daughter's dead and yeah, no one's in prison. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Uh, Ignatow, this is a good part. Ignat, yeah, so Annie just held up a uh, a picture of Ignatow and Mary Shore. Okay. They were special. Well, they look alike. I, I, I yeah. wasn't, I didn't want to say anything. I don't know why it took me so long to Google them in this. Like a crazy yeah. hot girl or a crazy girl look, Googled it. There won't be a, a movie about these guys no. anytime soon. Maybe a, a series podcast. He looks like that the guy Canadian, in that meme who's uh, The like, Canadian Ooh. series Mayday. <laughs> Uh, might pick that. Remember Mayday was doing every plane crash. Oh, God, yeah, those yeah, yeah. Were awesome. yeah. Yeah, I hope those guys but do these, some more these are These are yeah. some Kentucky folk. But I, could, it, I could see a little, like, Meryl Streep, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, Meryl Streep, I could yeah. see Glenn Close <laughs> after last week's <laughs> absolute <laughs> dis Oh, my God. Vibs' reaction to her was so... Glenn Close by... <laughs> by the way, I got a few DMs saying Vibs was right. His yeah. reaction to her is yeah. spot on because they had, yeah. they had they didn't know who she was, so they had to Google her after yeah. you reacted that way. They're like, ooh, he was right. I've only seen old Glenn Close, and yeah. then to see her young, I was like, what? Oh. She aged up the wrong way. I was like, oh, geez. It's like Helen Mirren. You see young Helen her. Mirren. Whew, she was a smoke show. She still is. And then you see an old Helen, Helen Mirren, and you're like, ooh, she is a Her smoke. boobs were huge. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's obviously, she's as she gets older, uh, she gets more gross. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, she's, I think she's just consistently a beautiful woman. Um, sort of like you, Annie. Ignatow's legal fees forced him to sell his house. That's where it starts to get a little good. And the new owners, as so often happens, wound up hiring a carpet installer to pull up the old carpet. Uh -oh. Especially if you have a house that was from a guy who was allegedly find? a murderer. 
That installer was pulling up a carpet from a hallway in Mel Ignatow's former home. Might even be Mel Ignato. I don't nearly give a shit. Right? Somebody come at me. Put some respect yeah, on his like name. Yeah, it's like pronouncing whore wrong. It's yeah, whoa. Yeah. It's whore. Really? Yeah, in Melly's matter. name. Melly Mel. When they, so they went, they ripped up the carpet. They uncovered a floor vent. Inside the vent, he found a plastic bag filled with jewelry belonging to Schaefer. She returned. Along with three rolls of undeveloped film. Ugh. Uh, when developed, there were more than 100 photos that proved that Mary Shore's testimony was completely true. It was all the photos she took. The images were the photos Shore had taken during Schaefer's murder, showing Ignatow raping and torturing his girlfriend. So she shoved him in there. Yeah, no, I think he kept knowing. it. No, was, I think he kept it as a as a thing. And oops, I forgot. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, you just for, forgot yeah. where he hit it. He's like, oh shit, well, I set him up. How about this? Ignatow's face was not in any of the pictures, <laughs> but body hair patterns <laughs> and moles matched like it perfectly. Like the Michael Jackson child. Melvin Henry <laughs> Ignatow yeah. had a specific body hair pattern uh, and moles. Uh, gross. That, oh, God. <laughs> this guy's awful. Imagine that being your job, matching those up. <laughs> oh, like, oh, my God. Yeah, right oh, ass. no, you missed. <laughs> and you have to give them all names. Yeah. Like, you know, Pinky left, you know. Oh. <laughs> Oh, so here's where double jeopardy, you know, fails. <laughs> because of double jeopardy laws, Ignatow could not be retried for ben- Brenda Schaefer's murder. This guy was off, right? This is awful. Instead, Ignatow was brought to trial for perjury. Remember when I said he had to go and do the grand jury testimony? They can get you on that, right? And based on the illegitimacy of his testimony in the murder trial, right, he outright confessed that he had committed the murder. So he gets put on for perjury. And during that trial... He confessed to committing the murder, right? Because all this new mole evidence was in. So then he was sentenced to eight years and one month for perjury. This is in 1991. Uh, excuse me, 1992. So we're still like, you know, pretty close. So in 1992, he gets eight years and one month for perjury. He served five. But in his 1997 release, they fucked him again. Good. He was charged again with another count of perjury in a case involving Schaefer's boss, like he perjured himself another time with, you know, with Schaefer's boss. I don't know the particulars of that. I don't fucking care. What I love is that Ignatow was sentenced to another nine years. So he did his original nickel, then he gets his another nine years. This time he served the whole nine, and Melvin Ignatow was released from prison in 2006. He was 68 years old. And lived as now a free man in Kentucky, but only for a couple of years. It was 2006. Because on September 1st, 2008, Mel Ignatow accidentally fell in his home. And in a moment of karma, he lacerated his head and arm on a glass coffee table. Just like the one. Similar to the one he raped, tortured, and killed Brenda Schaaf on almost exactly 20 years prior. So that 20-year journey I took you on started with him raping, torturing, and killing a girl on a glass table and ended with him, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up, and he never got up. He bled out and died at the age of 70. Good riddance, you fucking scumbag. What a Pretty cool. cool. Yeah. That's a double jeopardy case of Mel Ignatow yeah. sent in by Caleb uh, from story. Louisville. Not too bad, right? Love how the book end with the coffee table. I mean, it's like Hollywood wrote it. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, that is a movie. Yeah. yeah. And Caleb just well, gave me enough. He just yeah, put the Caleb. hook in me. Put the hook in me, Caleb. And uh, and so there you go. It is like a movie, but it is not a movie. The best Double Jeopardy movie is Double Ashley Je- Je- is Double, Double Jeopardy, Jeopardy with yeah. Ashley Judd and Tommy Lee Jones. I will say something. I will, I will fight you to the death. I will die on this hill. Yeah. The best Double Jeopardy movie is Fracture with uh, the handsome Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling and Anthony, and Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins, yeah. It's a great movie. Great. So good. Yeah, that's and a very good movie. Don't give away the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Everyone was gay. <laughs> right. um, Ryan Gosling's a young strapping lawyer, and Anthony yeah. Hopkins like commits a murder, and is like... And he's like a try genius to solve it. architect, yeah. or aeronautical engineer, or something like that. And he kills his wife. Who's mm-hmm. his wife? Was it um, the one with the vagina candle? Is it Gwyneth Paltrow? No. No? Too, too, but he doesn't... Age gap, no, that was, that would be crazy. That was another... Uh, uh, his always age gaps. Remember in yeah. the in the bear? She had black hair. When he was... Uh, oh, El McPherson. Banging El McPherson? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it the bear? Right. No, not no, the bear. No, The Edge. The Edge. Oh, another good movie. A-Hop. Twisted History of A-Hop's got to come here. Oh, dang. Um, of A-Hop? Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> Sir A-Hop. 
<laughs> Rosamund Pike. It's like House of Pancakes. Oh, Rosamund Pike. Yeah, Rosamund Pike. That's who plays Pike. his wife in that girl, movie. Right? Or oh, like I, that? yeah, yeah, I recognize her. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. She's great. Right, she's great. She's a great. Kind of has a little Paltrow look to her. Yeah. I think Paltrow was killed by like Viggo Mortensen in one of those movies too. Oh, when she was married to Michael Douglas. Yeah. Michael Douglas. Yeah. Hold him down. Munching box. <laughs> Fatal attraction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where have yeah, we mentioned? Right. So that's a brand new story. Mel Henry Ignatow is a brand new story for us. But where have we mentioned Double Jeopardy before on this podcast? Kind of. And right away when I heard this, I thought of Issei Sagawa. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm going to tell you the story again because I love the fact that this guy. In 1981, Issei Sagawa fell for a Dutch woman named Renee Hartevelt. Woohoo. <laughs> while he was in France. He invited her to where he was staying. Once there, he snuck up behind her and he shot her in the head. He posthumously raped her. And then after he raped her her corpse, he ate parts of her flesh, both raw and cooked, for three days until he decided to dump the body. And that's where he was caught in a park with two suitcases filled with her dismembered body parts. You remember that he was about to dump this stuff in a lake. Two joggers walked by and saw that there was blood dripping from it. So he was literally caught red-handed. Right. And that's how this guy was fucking caught in France. In interviews, he explained he'd been fascinated with cannibalism since the first first grade when he'd stare at a male classmate who uh, was originally from Indiana and ran cross country. He used to stare at his thigh. My short shorts. And he also admitted that he partook in bestiality with his family's dog. Um, But here's the thing about the story that kind of links it into this week. Sagawa was never prosecuted. He explicitly confessed to his crimes when he was caught by the French police claiming, I killed her in order to eat her flesh. No gray area there. But examining doctors declared him legally insane and unfit to stand trial, therefore leading authorities to deport him to his home in Japan. All right? Follow me here. When Sagawa went to Tokyo Psychiatric Matsuzawa Hospital, doctors there gave him a different diagnosis. Right? The French were like, he's crazy. And the Japanese were like, no, no. Psychologists found him sane and determined that he actually murdered the woman solely out of sexual perversion, which I think we all agree with. Yeah. yeah. Fuck this guy. But because of the charges against Sagawa in France have been dropped after he was deported, Japanese authorities couldn't access sealed court documents and were unable to charge him without the evidence. So he walked free. Maybe not a textbook definition of double jeopardy, but we're certainly close here. Right? Crazy in one place, not crazy in Japan. Can't get the records. Guy walks free. To make matters worse, he became a celebrity. He went on, like, cooking shows. He uh, used to do those man- manga, uh, anime type yeah. shit, and it was, like, fantasy stuff where he would kill and eat people. He, he was eating raw meat on fucking cooking shows. The guy was a celebrity in Japan. He sold nude paintings of women. He was a real fucking scumbag. And the reason I bring this up is because as recently as November 24th of last year, Issei Sagawa died at the age of 73 of pneumonia without ever serving a prison sentence for his crimes. So another guy who died, and good fucking luck. I mean, I'd love if he died by slipping on a bloody suitcase, you know, to have that, you know, whatever moment that we had with Ignatow. Choking on a thigh bone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Chokes on a chicken bone or something like that. Choke on that thigh bone. Yeah, yeah. It's Vibs' thighs are, are fucking hypnotic. Um, all right, so this is built where we comfort. Yeah, no, no way. Those things are built for speed, bro. Um, <laughs> built for built for a marathon. Built for distance. Yeah, this this is the important part of this podcast. We have a lot of fun with podcasts. We have a lot of fun with. Um, I think uh, Coleman had sent out in our thing. Oh, by the way, we we passed the milestone with a uh, YouTube. What was that milestone? Forty five k, forty five k on YouTube. Yeah, and so, like a bunch of, like a bunch of millions of downloads or something. Yeah, like that. we had like millions of views in the past. Like literally started this week, we were over a million of views on the page. So right. So for people who don't know what the uh, I don't know what the distribution of work here. I do everything. Uh, no. So Jeff comes in here and is my crutch. Right. So I, I just feel better doing stuff with Vibber and we don't talk outside of this. We don't hang out on the weekends or anything like that. But I just find Vibs to be the perfect foil for this. If he stops, if he wants to stop doing it. I'd be fucking done. Right. Annie is basically a sex toy for me, which you guys kind of yeah. know about. We, we get but then it. Annie does so much stuff with us for uh, social and with helping me out with the research. Like as I'm doing this stuff at the table yesterday with an absolute bag on from Talladega. Can we get the Issei Sagawa stuff? Like, literally, I said it like that. Can you get me the Issei Sagawa stuff? And all of a sudden, it's like there. Like, that stuff is fucking whatever. Um, and then John, obviously, is the producer from day one. 
And Jack Coleman, even though everyone seems to universally hate him. Yeah. So Jack is a guy who's been building up, um, you know, the YouTube page and also on TikTok and social stuff that we weren't, you know, on there before. Everyone does their thing, but we're seeing a lot of growth in what uh, what Jack's doing. So we appreciate it, Jack. Yeah. Uh, so wow. it should be mentioned on the show. Happy I appreciate everybody. And by the way, the difference between uh, Jack, Vibs, me, and John is Andy doesn't get paid. Somebody call Erica. Yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody get this fucking woman paid. And 170 fucking episodes. She's having sex with you. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. She has, she's Wait, just, you're similar not? to Mary Shore. <laughs> she's only getting paid three inches at a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. On a good day. Uh, so like, and so Jack had commented in the, um, this is why I went off on that tangent, in one of our group chats about how it's cool how we can lighten things up. And I think we talked about the crushing in Hillsboro. And I, you know, it said how it reminded me of dog piles when you're a kid, being on the bottom of dog piles. And then I had made a sexual innuendo about how, you know, she still winds up on the bottom of my dog pile. <laughs> and and I get that. This is very little uh, funniness to it. Like, there's not a lot of levity involved with this story, which is probably the most famous story about double jeopardy in the history of the United States. You guys agree with that? Yeah. Does I Emmett do. Till ring a bell? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Emmett Till. And I think with the benefit of the movie last year, or wherever the hell it is, it's ringing more and more bells. But if not, I, I I would be proud if people first heard about Emmett Till or if it actually became a little bit clearer to them. It's not something that they read in a textbook and forgot by the time they went to lunch because of what we're going to talk about now. Okay? Mm -hmm. And because Emmett Till is a tragedy that essentially started the civil rights movement. That's just a fact. I'll give you a little timeline on it after this. I haven't Go seen the, I haven't seen the Emmett Till movie. I'm throwing that out there. Fuck that I don't movie. know if anyone here has. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, haven't seen it I haven't seen it because I'm always like, oh, that's gonna be Oscar porn. Uh, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, they just are, uh, yeah, Hollywood. I, I, you know, when I was doing this, it said that the movie was um, from the, uh, and if somebody saw the movie and it's not that, it was from the perspective of Emmett's mom, maybe. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that's true, perhaps it's not. But there's been so many documentaries on this. But you're right, it's probably just uh, Oscar bait. I've know. seen enough documentaries where I know what's going on, and I'd, I'd probably recommend watching a documentary before this movie. I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to now justify. Oh, I like Selma. I swear I'm not racist. <laughs> no, no. I, I, no I, 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 I agree with you 100%. I think some documentaries are done better than other, and, and then Hollywood obviously stylizes some stuff. Um, so – not the history of racism in the United States. We're not going to do that. But you should know that um, on January 31st, 1865, and ratified on December 6th, 1865, was something called the 13th Amendment. And the 13th Amendment, we talked about the 5th Amendment, it abolished slavery in the United States. So slavery after 1865 was illegal. But that didn't eliminate racism, right? Like 1865, oh, no more racism. You know, quite the opposite. Well, glad, glad we're all done with that. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty wild. Well, welcome, that was ugly. Welcome aboard, everybody. Yeah. Right? Sorry about those chains. Get to work. Again, there is no levity in this part, and it'll get worse. Uh, but then you get the Jim Crow laws. I'll do an episode on the Jim Crow laws. Holy shit. Like, reading them, there's such a stain on our history. They were meant to marginalize African Americans by denying them the right to vote. Uh, to hold jobs, to get an education, or like a ton of other opportunities. And they were attempted, you know, those who attempted to defy these Jim Crow laws faced arrests, legal arrests, fines, jail sentences, violence, and death. Death? In between 1865, right, 13th Amendment, and 1955, I just fast forwarded 90 years, documented. Uh, nearly 900 black men were lynched in the state of Mississippi alone. That's it. And I know I'm like nine. So that's about 10 a year, you know, lynched. That's that's not good because, you know, a lot of trees were busier than what was documented. So this is very, very bad. I'm going to make a point about it in a second. I'll make it right now. This is Nazi-ish bad. And one of the tenets of Jim Crow laws was strict prohibition of interracial relationships. And they were called anti miscegenation laws. Okay? There was also something called the one drop rule that stipulated that anyone with any black ancestry, like people would never do 21 and me back then. Well, what's the thing that they do? 23 and me. 23 and me? 23 and me. <laughs> like, no one. Yeah. <laughs> 21 and me was like a movie with uh, Jennifer Garner, wasn't it? 20. 
It's 21. I don't want to make it. You mean like, no, no, no. You're thinking of Kate thriller? Hudson. Where she had no, 20 Gar- ways to lose a guy? No, Jennifer Garner, like. who's like in Alias. 13 she, going on 30? Meh. There's too many numbers. Did she do something where she was doing the yeah, thriller dance? Yeah, 13 going on 30. <laughs> All right. 21 and me. <laughs> right. There's another one. That'd By the way, this is so serious. Tw- well, mm. isn't there... What do you want me? just like... I think you just go in the wrong I'm direction. Going oh, I'm way. thinking 17 yeah. again. <laughs> 17 again might be it. 13 going on 30 with Mark Ruffalo. Again? Zach, no, Zach Efron and no, that's with that. Mark Ruffalo. Mark Ruffalo, what's the name of that <laughs> 13 one? going on 30. I remember a lot that. Of and, and Zach Efron, you probably said that already. Yeah. Zach Efron's yeah, yeah. in 13 going on 30, right? No, no that's, no, that's 17 no, no. again. God damn 17 it. 17 again. Mark Ruffalo in... 13 going on 30 with Jennifer Garner. 21 and me does not exist. 23 and me. 21 and me is. Yes, 23 and me. 23 and me is the the thing you spit in a jar and they find out if you're a. a 23 and me is what got the is what got. Uh, are you saying, DeAngelis, the strength? Are you the, saying the, 23 in me? Because that's a oh, porno. Oh, yes. <laughs> you that know what? There's 21 in yeah. me. Is 21 and about. over. 21 and over is a movie. Yep. And then 21, the card movie. Barely yeah. 18 <laughs> is a magazine. Um. All right. So anyway. Back then, the reason you wouldn't do any kind of genetic testing is because they had the the one drop rule. There wasn't genetic testing back then. It stipulated that anyone with any black ancestry, one drop of black blood, was legally black and could not marry a white person. That's fucking harsh. And it wasn't just blacks. Like Laws also defined what made a person Asian or what made a person Native American in order to pre- prevent these groups for marrying whites. It's a eugenics thing that we spoke about so many times. Virginia had the Pocahontas exception for prominent white families. Um, it sounds like it's going to be reasonable. Pocahontas. Yeah. <laughs> so if you happen to be descended from Pocahontas, then the one drop rule didn't apply to you. You were still white, right? So that, yeah, so they gave Pocahontas. Either way, the point that I'm trying to make okay. is that after 1865, after we freed the slaves, uh, people of color, POCs, could not even fraternize, uh, much less marry or have sex with whites for fear of death. That's what I'm trying to make. So now that you, that table is set, enter Emmett Till. It, okay? Can Go I, ahead, please. It, I think the thing that I've taken from history over the years is just like, uh, one, black guys went over to fight for World War II and then came back and then had to deal, deal with Jim Crow stuff in the South awful Mm -hmm. and then if you lived in the north granted you still had to deal with racism but you go down south and then there's a completely different set of rules you're like it was like you're in a different country both of those points both of those points i'm i'm going to talk about but the second point that you're making couldn't be more um uh personified than in the story of emmett till because he was a 14 year old kid from chicago he's a 14 year old kid from chicago his parents, I believe, divorced when he was a baby. Actually, I believe his father was um, violent towards his mom, Mamie Till, from the movie Till. So they split. I think he was one years old. And he never got to meet Louis Till, his dad. One of the reasons he never got to meet him because he was an African-American GI during World War II. And after enlisting in the United States Army following a trial for domestic violence against Mamie Till, uh, he was chose jail time. So it was one of those things where World War II is going on. You get caught beating your wife. They're like, you want to go to jail or you want to go to war? That's wild. I mean, and you, you choose war. Sm- oh, he went to war? He didn't go he to jail? He went to war. Okay. But he went yeah. to war, and when he was over there, he's court marshaled on two counts of rape and one yeah, count right. of murder in Italy. So he went to oh. war, and he was raping the shit out of people. In it. You know what I mean? So, so he, he was found guilty, and he was executed by hanging in Pisa, Italy. Whoa. I'm not doing this to denigrate the story of Emmett Till but I'm starting by letting you know he was raised by a single mom in Chicago okay and his father was a fucking scumbag who was hanged for raping people and who beat his mom okay I think sometimes that's overlooked troubled home life yeah um maybe that's all besides the point I don't know he was a Chicago kid who wound up spending time in Mississippi with his family and that's the first flair that Jeff brought up. Growing up in Chicago, he was not prepared for that level of segregation that he would encounter in the Deep South, particularly in Mississippi, that hang, hanged 900 black guys after 1865. So one day, while going to a local candy store, and there are many versions of what happened that day, one version of the story 
is that Emmett, fourteen year old kid, and listen, he was like a confident kid, cocky. Chicago kid. He was a jokester. City, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he spoke exactly like Eddie from oh, Chicago. Yeah, oh no. Yeah, this Mississippi's so nice. And the weather's so good, you know, Chicago, I'm freezing my fucking balls off. I heard him doing this yesterday. You're going to get some yeah. candy? Bridget looks at me, she's like, is he doing that guy from Chicago yeah. again? I don't know why you were doing him, but he was doing this. Yeah, let's go get some fucking candy. Uh, he probably didn't curse. We, we, played, so, yeah. we played Dave. Dave loved the impression. Oh, I was did so, oh I was is that so what jealous. he was doing the dozen when oh, the, you were yeah. doing that? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's why you were doing that. that you was, were doing the Oh, dozen. Eddie guessed a, um, a Katy Perry song. <laughs> oh, I didn't yeah. think it was Roar. And I was pretty sure I wasn't. I kissed the girl and I liked it. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with uh, disclosure. Final answer. Wait, so we heard Eddie? Actually, no, that was, no, that was you talking. Yeah. yeah. She's like, oh god, Daddy's doing that guy yeah. from Chicago. Eddie knows the entire. I was Katie staring. Perry catalog. You know, you say that Dave enjoyed it. So when you're doing the, by the way, how about this for left turn? I'm about to go into this horrible thing. Um, so you kind of, you know, you're doing it by Zoom. So you're looking at. You can only look at the people individually. You can't like concentrate on the the group. So as I'm doing the Eddie impersonation, I'm looking dead at Eddie to see if he's <laughs> smiling or if he's mad. Because at my core, I love Eddie from Barstool. I mean, you like, always have. like hug the shit out of Eddie from Barstool. We almost did Twisted History with Eddie. Yeah. Like, yeah, we That's were right. thinking about because he was about to move to New York. I think the first two that we filmed, it was almost like a pilot with me and you. Yep. And then I think we did it both. He did this tone, right? There might even be like a, he's done a couple. Yeah. There might even be a Twisted History Kamikaze with Eddie. Because that I'm was like a sure. pilot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be crazy. All oh, these things are flying at the fucking... Um, <laughs> so I'm looking straight at Eddie to see. But you're right, Jeff. I'm assuming everyone else was probably looking at Dave to see if he liked it or not. Oh, that was all I was Because it's different at. when you're doing it with Dave. You're always seeing whether or not it's, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Did he like it? I have no idea I wasn't looking. Loved but, it. But, yeah, apparently. I was so Dave jealous. loved it? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get back to it. Uh, so he, it's, it's 1955. Did I even mention that it was 1955? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it's 1955. Jim Crow laws are really, really being uh, upheld in the South. And a kid from the North is down there spending time with his family. He goes into a candy store. One version of the story is that he whistled at Carolyn Bryant. Carolyn Bryant's husband, Roy Bryant, I think he was on a fishing or a hunting trip. He wasn't there. She was minding the store. And, he, you know, maybe Emmett Till whistled at her. And believe me, there's been defenses that he spoke with a sort of a lispy way. So maybe like something sounded like a whistle. Yeah, yeah, yeah like something <laughs> like that. Uh, but the story got worse and worse, right? Like almost made up. This actually reminds me a lot of Black Wall Street. Yeah, because that's yes. how that started. Yeah, yeah. Some uh -huh. people said yeah. he raped the girl in the elevator yeah. or touched her inappropriately. Some yeah. said they had a relationship, and others said nothing. She just screamed when she saw a spider, and they assumed that it was yeah. the and gentleman that, that well, got the, the elevator. Uh, the other one too with the train car. Um, I, we did that recently with the the teenage guys on the train car. Oh, and the they, the vigilante shooter in in the New yeah, York City I, subway. Oh, Bernard Getz. Bernie Getz. Yes. Bernie Getz. Yeah, when they were panhandling. For some like, reason, I thought it was in Alabama. No, no, it was in. Uh, if you're talking about Bernie Getz, like there was story. a storyline. Now, people who learned about Bernie Getz, I think this is the point we made back then. By the way, I listened to a podcast on Emmett Till, just because I wanted to, because I was on a plane. I didn't have time to like do some stuff. And the way these uh, two English voices had spoke about him, so fucking boring. So I'm thinking of the Scottsboro Boys, uh, nine black teenagers who were accused of raping two white women on board a train near Scottsboro, Alabama. Okay. Okay. Where was yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, 1931. Right. So that's right in between. Yep. The yeah. Oklahoma and. And then you fast forward the Bernie. Like my point was the uh, sometimes in uh, um, black news outlets, it was like. These kids were just like panhandling. Right. Oh, the Bernie Getz story. Yeah. Yeah. And then in reality, like the kids were 19 and 18 years old. Yeah. They called them kids. Yeah. But yet. And oh, they were they were on their way to like rob another store. Yeah. I was just giving you the facts. Like mm -hmm. this isn't yeah. anything. But so everything gets a little bit. And to show you how it gets, what did Emmett do? Like we don't know what Emmett does, but it was said that he may have whistled at her, and the store was owned by her husband Roy. And later, Carolyn upped the ante and claimed that Till insulted her. And then later still, she claimed he touched her hand. But in the courtroom at she the trial... She touched my leg? Yeah. Dumb and dumber. At, yep. the courtroom, <laughs> at the courtroom trial for Till's killers, one of them wound up being Carolyn's husband, she claimed that Till grabbed her, followed her, and used sexually crass language to harass her. That escalated quickly. So it went from anywhere from a whistle 
to him being sexually harassing. But either way, Roy Bryant uh, was the husband, and he went after Emmett about a week later when he got back from this trip, and he brought his half-brother, John Millam, with him, and they went on a manhunt for Emmett Till. They actually, when they were going to find this kid, they actually kidnapped another black kid, and it wasn't even Emmett. So they weren't, they weren't, they were on tilt, as they say in the poker world. All right, that's 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 pretty racist. They finally, yeah, yeah <laughs> yes, exactly. So when they finally got to the house that Emmett was staying in, I think maybe it was his grandfather who said, "Don't take him, I'll pay you off," or something like that. And uh, they forcibly removed Emmett Till from the house. Now, full-grown men. This is a 14-year-old boy. Okay, so there's not much way to justify what they had happened. There's not like any type of, um, I don't know, spin you could put on it from a racist standpoint. Um, they beat the balls off. They threw him in the trunk of the car, I believe. They brought him someplace. They beat the balls on him. And then ultimately, they made him carry a 75-pound cotton gin fan to the bank of the Tallahatchie River and ordered him to take off his clothes. They beat him nearly to death, gouged out one of his eyes, shot him in the head, and then threw his body, tied to the cotton gin fan with barbed wire, into the river. Okay? He was in the river for three days when his corpse was recovered, but he was so disfigured and bloated that Moe's Wright could only identify it by the initial ring that Emmett was wearing. Uh, Authorities wanted to bury the body quickly, but Till's mother, up in Chicago, Mamie Bradley, requested he was sent back to Chicago. Then Mamie Till, who I believe again was a big part of the movie, um, insisted they have an open casket funeral so that all the world could see what racist murderers in the South had done to Emmett. I included a picture of Emmett's open casket in the uh, script here. And I don't suggest that you Google it. And listen, nobody looks good after being in a river for three uh, days, and Emmett is no uh, exception. So this mom put this abomination of her son in there, and it incensed everybody. Jet, an African-American weekly magazine, published a photo of Emmett's corpse, the one that I gave you guys, and soon the mainstream media picked up the story. Less than two weeks later, after Emmett's body was buried, here's a positive, Millam, the half-brother, and Bryant, the husband, went on trial in a segregated a courthouse in Sumner, Mississippi. Let's give you your first idea. It's like a segregated courthouse. There are few witnesses besides Mo Wright, Moe's Wright, who positively identified the defendants as Emmett's killers. So they're dead to rights on this. Uh, but now I'm going to tell you the same thing. It's an all-white jury. They were pounding beers during the trial. Like they're drinking beer and stuff during the trial. Like, it was very, very disrespectful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Defense told the jury that their forefathers would turn over in their graves if they found these two white guys guilty. Like, that was one of the mentions of the defense. It's It's crazy, right? Um, It took 67 minutes to acquit these two men. 67 minutes of trial. And one jury member told reporters it wouldn't have taken that long if they didn't stop to take a smoke break. Millam confessed in an interview with Time later on about what they had done and that's where it becomes double jeopardy they couldn't be tried again um millam lived until his 80s rory bryant lived until 1994 and i believe carolyn bryant is still still alive alive, yeah Yeah. in a non-taped interview years later in 2007 she'd come clean and said that her testimony was 100 percent a lie yep so maybe it was closer to a whistle she he, and she yeah. she whistled as he whistled as she was walking to her car. Yeah. She's like, I was going to get my gun and, and take care and right. you know, on her own. But she, I guess. And Millam can confess to Time, Time Magazine. That's not a small publication. So that's that's one of the places where, you know, for our, for the for the benefit of this podcast, double jeopardy uh, didn't work, right? Like mm-hmm. I, you mm-hmm. know, bringing up the times where it does work is probably a million times a day, but that's probably the most famous. And I mentioned. You know, from the beginning, that this tragedy was essentially started the civil rights movement. So that's why I think that it's it's important for you guys to know it because Emmett was killed August 1955. So his body was shown, you know, in and around August 1955, maybe going into September. Rosa Parks happened in December 1955. So you have like this whole thing, the, and the, then the yeah. catalyst yeah. that kind of got yeah. it going. And then know that in 1963, right, um, eight years afterwards. And eight years to the day after Emmett Till's death, uh, 250,000 people marched on Washington and listened to the I Have a Dream speech. And an arrest warrant was was written for her, but they never served it. Yeah. So 
yeah, so th- this is right in the middle of uh, of what th- – not right in the middle. This is right at the forefront of people finally saying we've had enough, mm-hmm. okay? And then I'm going to go into a left turn with the Jim Crow laws because they said it was very Nazi-ish, right? Mm-hmm. They started after the abolition of slavery. Again, 1865. I'm hoping people remember this. 1865, no more slavery. Jim Crow laws, 1955. Emmett Till, 1963. I had a dream. Okay? So we're 1865. In 1935, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a guy with a tiny little mustache and a bad haircut, right? Nazi Germany passed two radically discriminatory pieces of legislation. The Reich Citizenship Law... And the second one is pretty self-explanatory. The Law for the Protection of German Blood and German Honor. Together they were known as the Nuremberg Laws, and they laid the legal groundwork for the persecution of Jewish people during the Holocaust and World War II, when the Nazis set out to legally disenfranchise and discriminate against Jewish citizens. That's what they wanted to do. I'd used the word disenfranchise just a couple minutes ago, right? They weren't just coming up with this shit out of the air, the Nazis. They closely studied the laws of our country. People need to know that America in the late, excuse me, in the early 20th century was the leading racial juris, like the biggest racist jurisdiction in the world. And, uh, what was it? Legally. Gen- genetics. They were the eugenics. forefront of that. Yeah, eugenics, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So like legally, we were able to discriminate against a type of people better than anyone else. And I'm not talking about, you know, primitive cultures that relied on religious law and shit like that. We're talking about state-sponsored uh, racism. And we were better than anybody else at it until the Nazis. right? Yeah, no, and the no. Nazis started by copying off of us. They copied our assignment. Okay, uh, Nazi lawyers, as a result, were interested, looked very closely at, and admired the Jim Crow era laws, ultimately deciding that their only flaw is that they didn't go far enough. Okay? One of the most striking Nazi views was that Jim Crow was a suitable racist program in the United States because American blacks were already oppressed and poor. That was the that was the difference. Like we were we were killing and discriminating against people who for the most part were former slaves when this first started. So they were poor and uneducated, but in Germany by contrast, where the Jews were more rich and certainly more powerful, it was necessary for them to take more severe measures. So they had to go Jim Crow plus. Jim Crow plus. The affirmation miscegenation state laws that threatened severe criminal punishment for interracial marriage were something radical Nazis were very eager to do in Germany as well. Right? Like they did not want you fucking with Germans if you weren't German. And we'll go back to the one drop rule that stipulated that any black ancestry you were legally black and could not marry. The Nuremberg Laws were actually more lax than that. We were worse than the Nazis, right? When deciding how to allow marriage and or sex between, in this case, Jewish and Aryan people. Rather than adopting that one drop rule, the Nazis decreed that a Jewish person was anyone who had three or more Jewish grandparents. That's a little bit more lax, you know? Oh, no, I have a black uncle. Fuck you, you're out. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. with the Nazis, you had to have three Jewish grandparents. Which means, and here is my point, American racial classification law was much harsher than anything the Nazis themselves were willing to introduce in Germany. Like they said, the one drop rule, the Nazis were like, oh, nine, that's too strict. Like they said that about our fucking, like the Nazis were like, holy shit. And yeah. that is why the Nazis weren't uniformly condemned in the U.S. before the country entered the war. We were doing the same thing here or worse to blacks for 50 years before the Nazis started doing it to Jews. That's why in the early 1930s, American eugenicists welcomed Nazi ideas about racial purity and even republished their propaganda. We had a Nazi Germany camp in Long Island. We spoke about mm-hmm. Henry Ford and his love affair with fucking uh, Hitler. Hitler had a Henry Ford up in his office, right? Like, if, yeah, if you, yeah. Watch, if you watch old documentaries about like the segregated South, they're waving like swastika flags still yeah. and talking about we got to keep the bloodlines pure. <laughs> that was Absolutely. My, that was, my no, that was great. <laughs> American aviator Charles Lindbergh accepted a swat stick of metal from the Nazi party in 1938. Then, of course, the Germans went too far, which we all know, right? And they built giant fucking ovens. And once the United States entered the war, it took a decidedly anti-Nazi stance. 
And here's the second point that Jeff made before we started. The first was that Emmett was a northern guy who didn't understand the southern, just how strict this southern shit was, right? So yeah. he fucked around and he found out in the worst possible way ever, right? I'm not, I'm not demeaning it, but that's exactly what had happened. And if he was totally innocent of it, then it just makes it 100% worse. But if his only crime was whistling, fuck, that's a tragedy, okay? Um, what Jeff was saying was with black soldiers. That's the thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Black American troops noticed the similarities between the two company, uh, countries and the hypocrisy for us fighting for persecuted Jews abroad while continuing to shit on black citizens at home. Yeah. So black soldiers started a double V campaign, and its goal was a victory abroad against the Axis powers and also a victory at home against Jim Crow. And it didn't really work right away, right? So that's what started the fight from soldiers also, and it was one of the, you know was one of the uh, most defined uh, portions of the civil rights movement. Yeah. Right? And, and I think a crazy thing that GIs came back and white GIs got the the GI bills passed. So they were able to buy homes and yeah. houses and start a family. But black people didn't get the GI bill <laughs> in their favor. So they couldn't start a home and get a mortgage and do all that shit. So they were a, a step back with that. The Civil Rights Act didn't come until 1964. The Voting Rights Act was not until 1965. That's not at the end of World War II. No. Right. No. Yeah. And so you're over there, honestly, fighting for the freedom of, believe me, World War II had a lot of moving parts, but the the you know more salacious, sexy part was freeing Jews from ovens, right? Like that. That's the thing, right? That's that's the demonizing part of it. So you're over there trying to get these people away from persecution, then you're coming back and having your grandfather being persecuted at home. Um, so anyway, so that's what makes Emmett Till such a important story in American history and one of the most important uh, cases of double jeopardy ever in the history of the world. Okay? That's it for Emmett Till. Uh, there are a couple other uh, more high-profile double jeopardy cases if you want to dive deeper. Uh, David Smith, uh, who mutilated a number of women, he was a serial killer. Uh, he changed prosecution laws in the U.K., and he did a deep dive on him. Listen, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but his double jeopardy connection was that they changed laws because of this guy. They found some similarities with the way that he was killing prostitutes and whatnot. And so he also he, had abnormally large feet. Oh yeah, I think on him because he had feet that are actually smaller than mine, but were considered <laughs> abnormally large. They made molds of his feet to see if they were at other crime scenes <laughs> because they were abnormally large. So I'm like, how how large are they? They were only little 14s. Yeah, I'm a 15. <laughs> uh, what's up? <laughs> Uh, so David Smith was another pretty high profile case. And then there was the murder of Sam Shepard's wife uh, by the bushy man. Um, so look that up like, or, or we'll do it at some other part because I think I'm going to do something on F. Lee Bailey at some mm -hmm. point. Uh, F. Lee Bailey is a lawyer that uh, he was part of the dream team that got OJ off. But what brought F. Lee Bailey into um, national spotlight was his work with uh, Sam Shepard, who was being tried for the murder of his wife. Oh, it was the um, it was the inspiration for the fugitive. Did everyone see the fugitive with Harrison yeah. Ford? No, I didn't kill my wife. I didn't kill my wife. I don't That's care. That's a much better I know. One. Yeah, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. I thought he didn't say I don't care. I, I know. I think he says I know. No, I think no. He said I don't care because at the other later on he says I don't negotiate. I don't. I negotiate. didn't kill my wife. That's yeah. the only important part. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't care. <laughs> it was so the one-armed man. Yeah. So the one-armed man was actually the bushy man. And the, the so, you know, man. go get a cane pole and fish him out or something like that. Um, and so this guy was found, and an F. Lee Bailey came in. I remember that one exemption that I'd said that if they, like, it was some sort of tampering. Like, he was saying that the way it became a media circus, uh, Sam Shepard was not able to get a fair trial. So that was the connection with Double Jeopardy. But it's a pretty um, fascinating case, Sam Shepard. Uh, but I'm going to close soon because we're, we're going to have to get the hell out of here. We have to do movie quotes, too. Yeah. Do a twist okay. With uh, Adam Richmond. Hang on, hang on. Let's let's. I know we're getting out of here. And we're in a hurry. No. <laughs> I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 he, just, uh, he jumps off in the fucking zip-up sweater. That sweater is hot. You right? don't. Sweater. You yeah. don't want Tommy Lee Jones chasing you. No. You do not. No. He was Al Gore's roommate in college. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yep. Just throwing out knowledge, Vince. That's what I do. <laughs> Remember how delicious the hospital food scene when Harrison Ford finally got to the hospital and he clipped up his beard and you know, like grabbed a quick sandwich and stuff Yeah, like he grabbed that. a buttered roll and a coffee. It's yeah. the best. And the kid who got like, it was a puncture wound in his lung. Do you remember so what holiday it was? Anyone? Uh, 
uh, Guy Fawkes. No, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. Oh, the parade. Oh. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, <laughs> I'm going to close on the real Jeopardy. I didn't know that Trebek was the original host. I did. People all know this now because Trebek is dead. Did they do all these retrospectives? Yeah. He I, was or I, was I, not. I, didn't he create the show? I just assumed no. he was. No, not even fucking close. I thought to he created, created he was, the show and somebody else hosted. He was on a did. different game show at the time. I forget the name of it. I read his uh, memoir actually when he died. Show yeah, off, Art Fleming was the guy in 1964. Art Fleming, I think, did it from like Frank s- Fleming's dad, and then yes. and then Alex Trebek <laughs> took it from him. And it's the like night a- he found out that Alex Trebek was getting it, he said, "You go to bed. You don't watch these Mets in the <laughs> yeah. playoffs." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it began. But I, so like all I knew about was we had gone over once Wheel of Fortune because I was stunned by how much Pat Sajak made, and I was stunned that Vanna White was originally um, Susan Stafford, right. and she turned down the gig. She was she was the first person to be like uh, to have a corporate sponsorship as a letter turner, mm-hmm. and she was getting like fifteen hundred dollars an episode. It was a pretty sweet gig. She's like, "This is going nowhere. I'm out." And then Vanna White went in what I think is the best gig in in Hollywood. Oh my oh, god, it's yeah. great! And she got so much press a couple of weeks ago because she wore a half dress, half pantsuit. Did you see that? No. Oh, it was like it was super controversial right. for some reason. They have I was their, uh, their daughter doing it now too. Sometimes Did they? she'll step in. Yeah. Oh, Oof. really? How cute! Really? Yeah. Oh, she's just oh, I was bagging yeah. what Vanna was raking. Mm. <laughs> and she did a Playboy spread and stuff like big. that. What's that? Oh, big pendulum. No, she's <laughs> she's actually pretty tight. Um, I like to buy a vowel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the O. Exactly. O. 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 Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's explaining to like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So Susan Safford was the original man to go over. Similarly, original host was Art Fleming. So the show went off the air for a while. And then it was coming back. Maybe even Art took a pass. i got to find that out. But Trebek got the gig in 84, kept it till his death in 2020. One of the things that changed was when it was Art Fleming. I'm going to talk about Jeopardy right now because this fascinates me. Uh, and Double Jeopardy. Right? With Art Fleming, as soon as the question came up, if you knew the answer, you could buzz in. With the new Jeopardy, you have to wait till Alex. It doesn't register till he's done talking. Yeah. So, like, people were able to, like... As soon as the thing went up, you would buzz, and then you could read it yourself rules to you. and do it. You well, know what I mean? So that's a, a common misconception is some people get on there and just slam <laughs> the buzzer. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. You're not getting the, fir- the first try yeah. at it. you just got to be consistent presses, right. and oh. then you'll get through. But Art Fleming, you could just go right away. Exactly, yeah. And then Art Fleming didn't even like the way that Jeopardy was going. He said it was starting to play down to stupid people, that they should concentrate more on New Yorkers <laughs> because New Yorkers are the smartest people in the world, stuff like that. That Whatever. But, East so, Coast elitist. Yeah. <laughs> so in comes, in comes uh, Trebek, and he's obviously the GOAT. Uh, what is professional gambler James Holzhauer's strategy when competing on Jeopardy? The GOAT. Yeah. Holzhauer, who is he? He's the third highest earning American game show contestant of all time. Best known for his 32-game winning streak as champion of Jeopardy from April to June 2019. Holzhauser won $2.4 million in his wow. 33 appearances, making him the second highest winner in Jeopardy. <sighs> Regular play, non-tournament. Yeah, see, I don't I think Ken Jennings is better. It's just different Ken eras. Ken Jennings, you number com- one. You can't compare the two. No, you yeah. can't. Ken what? Jennings is better. Ken Jennings, <laughs> oh, shit. he won 2.4. Ken Jennings won 2.5. I thought he Listen, got passed. Ken, Ken Jennings is the Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah. LeBron James and James are are spot on. They just had a whole different knack to their game yeah. that can't even be compared. Yeah. By the way, Ken Jennings, you, you're talking about that like with Jeopardy. Don't be fucking myopic. Uh, Jeopardy, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Some called Grand Slam, which I've never seen. And who wants to be a millionaire? Cumulatively, Ken Jennings won over $5 million on those shows. Wow. So not only 2.4 in Je- uh, 2.5 in Jeopardy, won new, another 2.5 just going around. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Trebek had a lot uh, in his memoir, like a lot of respect for Ken. Um, Did I say that? Yeah, Trebek had a lot of respect for him and even said towards the end, he's not sure where the direction of the show will go, who will take over, but he's like, I think it would be in relatively good hands. He's the best. Yeah. I hate Maya Bialik. Oh, yeah. Oh, how could you say that? No, I'm not a a a fan either. I don't think she does a good job. Maybe that's sexist to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I believe me, and listen, I'm I'm not a Ken Jennings simp. I thought that Conan O'Brien would be the perfect fit for that. I think you I've did. said that you here said before. That out loud. Yeah, I, 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 I think awesome. that's a really good one. Brian yeah. Cranston was the guy that Brian I wanted Cranston. to take a spot. Ooh. Oh yeah, that's I think a good he's one like too. A, a wise older man. Yeah, people yeah. respect him. Yeah. like a Walter father. White. Jeff D. Lowe thought that Jeff D. Lowe should have got the shot. He, yeah. So did Francis. I think Francis was, Francis. was convinced Francis that Francis just he... threw his hat in the Tucker Carlson thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> to pick me up. 
Um, so we'll go back to James Holzhauer. But every Holzhauer. time you say Trebek or anybody, I can't help but think of that skit on Saturday Night Live yep. when they have Sean Your Connery Trebek. Trebek. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your mother's <laughs> a whore, Trebek. Yeah. Let's yeah. tits now. <laughs> yeah. Ape tip 20. <laughs> yeah. No, a petit dejeuner. He's like, ape tit dejeuner. <laughs> Uh, James Moon. Holzhauer, his nickname <laughs> the is... The Rapist. Yeah. <laughs> is uh, Jeopardy James. <laughs> Jeopardy <laughs> James is a terrible nickname. I think that's great. You like it? Jeopardy James is great. It's not Jeopardy Jennings. <laughs> yeah. It's James. Okay. Jeopard- it's like a Jesse James. All right. We're yeah. agree to disagree. JJ. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I guess you guys know it because you're more Jeopardy people towards the end than me. So he played horizontally. Yeah. First going down the thing. And uh, like everyone else... I appreciate when people go one category at a time, two to a thousand. I'd like to know why everybody doesn't start at a thousand. Well, that's what that's James what he does. Did, yeah. So yeah, what he did? I know why everybody of, doesn't. I know he's I know, instead he of going, hard, you know, instead of going vertically uh, in order, which it gets like progressively harder. Obviously, I'm not telling you anything. I don't know why this blew my mind because I love doing that because that's when I can sweep. You know what I mean? Like I get, I get a little bit of fucking. Everybody speed. knows senior yeah. year should be a breeze. You take all yeah. the heavy stuff in the beginning, and yeah. then you, you know, you you, you sail yeah, into the right. sunset. But where I want, I want to go here and go down. He goes here and just starts going across. Yeah, yeah, yeah which He's is talking which, for double jeopardy. Yeah. He starts sweeping across the highest value clues first, no matter what the category is. Once he's cleared out all the thousand clues in the first round, he starts climbing up the bottom left corner of the board where he inevitably hits on the daily doubles because they're always down there. And his strategy here becomes ballsy in that eight out of ten times he goes all in on daily doubles. Like, you have to have a category that he's never fucking heard of from not to go fucking, I'd like to bet the wad. I'll take John Mayer songs for a thousand, (laughs) all in. (laughs) Jake Marsh. Imagine if you got a daily double after you won all of them and that was it. It was a John I Uh, know, uh, right? You know, one of my favorite things to do with Jeopardy is when they announce final Jeopardy, guessing what the answer will be before even hearing the Uh, question. Yeah, yeah. Like you just think whatever the category is, I've gotten it once. You're playing chess. And I think it was Roosevelt. And that's enough to keep you coming back for the rest of your life. Every time. I had a whole drinking game to Jeopardy. Come Uh, on. It's the best. Finally, and this may be his most genius move of all, his strategy is conniving in that when you jump between categories horizontally, you make it extremely difficult to grasp what the category is even is. If I tune into Jeopardy late and I don't hear Alex oh, or Jennings go. or me, I'm like, tell me what the categories are. Mm. I have no fucking clue. You get very like, angry. I don't know. If it's not potent potables, like, and it just gives you a potent potable thing that I know, I can't get it. Flew like, I need to do it. Q. So this guy starts going across. So you never really, like, so you have to switch your bla- brain from Potent Potables <laughs> to 80s rock to this. I, I love this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. when you What's get What's your the, strategy, Vibs? I'd go, I'd go down, just like, just like a... You uh, heard I'd that go about down. you. Yeah. You heard that about you. But no, I love, I love that this guy's like the Bill Belichick of, of Jeopardy. He's just changed it all up. He's changed the game. Yeah. So moving around the board horizontally and from the bottom up makes it that much more difficult for his opponents to gain any advantage whatsoever. Um, I threw in a little bit of double jeopardy just to uh, to lighten stuff up with all the um, Nazis and American racism. That was the Twisted History of Double Jeopardy. Thank you, 3G, for sponsoring us. And uh, what are we doing next week? I have no fucking clue. Want to do movie quotes? I don't know. Oh, yeah, I'll take a look. I don't, I don't know if there's enough there, but we'll check it out. Do I didn't them. kill my wife. What are you doing? Yeah. Anything you need to plug? Nope, nothing needs plugged. We're just chill. We're here. We're yeah, here doing we're history. Good. That's what needs to be plugged. Yeah. Uh, Liam history. Was, Liam's going to put out uh, something from Talladega. We just did a big Talladega weekend. It was rubbing his racing with me, Spider. Uh, Dana Beers was down there. Alex Bennett was down there. Um, so we had the whole crew down there. Talladega <laughs> is a party that has a race going around it. Yep. Nice. It's, it's absolutely as Southern as I've ever been. You want to talk about, for people who have stuck, on, stuck around, the most patriotic I've been in a long time is I rode the big rig with Spider and, and company mm-hmm. going around the track with the 100-foot flag behind us with everyone saluting Johnny us Ray. as we were going by and clapping for us, and we were doing 110 miles an hour in a fucking big rig. And in when the, it hit the, the turn, turns. when he hit the turn, Liam bumped his head. Like I think Liam has a black eye. Smashed <laughs> oh his God. head into the camera. Spider went into like the, the, the cabinets. You know, I was sitting down, and I brought my son Mick, so he got to – to experience that whole thing too. So if you guys do get a second to check it out, I have Ref and Robbie coming out every Thursday, going up into um, going up into Rough and Rowdy. Me and Robbie do this thing where we're previewing stuff about the fights that are going to go down in Huntington, Virginia, on May 12th. You'll be refing then if it's in I'll Virginia. I'll be refing. I'm gonna I'm gonna ref a couple of fights again. 
Um, so Ref and Robbie leading up to Rough and Rowdy. Uh, rubbing his race. A lot of R's. Rubbing his race in Twisted History and Barstool Finance, if you get a sec. Uh, that's it for us. We'll see you guys next week.